So today my guest is Greg Lemley of Lemley Theaters. Greg, how are you doing? Thanks for your time. Good to be here. So let's talk uh, about, what is it? Maybe January, February, March of 2020. Um, have you ever had a challenge like a pandemic in the history <laughs> of Lemley Theaters before? Oh, no, no, we've never come close to anything like this. Um, you know, and we've been in business since 1938. Um, I remember commenting days after the shutdown that, uh, I mean, it was just, um, I mean, we stayed open during the, you know, civic unrest following, you know, in Watts in 65, we stayed open, you know, on 9-11, we were open. I mean, other than one theater, which had some physical damage, we were open the, the same day of the Northwood earthquake in 94. Wow. Um, you know, we, we, we just feel like, you know, well, hey, I mean, the theaters are designed to be open 365 days a year. And frankly, even in, you know, moments of crisis like those times, you know, people want to get out. They need yeah. to get out. Um, so... So are you even like to the last possible minute when, you know, basically the shutdown came out, were you just kind of trying to figure out logistically, all right, what are we going to be able to do? I mean, were you starting to take some precautions on your own or did you sense it was it was coming and there was no stopping it? I mean, we had already taken a precaution, of course, of, of advising people who were high risk, especially, you know, older patrons that they probably should consider not coming to movies. Um, certainly that last week or weekend, we had already agreed that we were voluntarily going to reduce our capacities to something under 50%, uh, you know, in the auditorium, we didn't know exactly. I mean, you know, not that we got ended up getting close to that, but you know, that was something we announced to the public, uh, for those people who wanted to come out that they would feel a little more confidence. Um, you'll remember at the time that the CDC was almost recommending against mask wearing yeah right um, which you know ended up not being a scientific recommendation so much as they didn't want a run on on ppe and denying it to healthcare workers um but you know beyond all that and just sort of the things we were trying to do to um you know voluntarily address public you know health concerns we were starting to look at you know which venues were still doing enough business to warrant being open and did we need to consider some strategic closures simply for reasons of profitability mm -hmm. um and in fact had gone very far down the road of considering some you know close this one keep this one open that kind of thing uh until basically it was taken out of our hands yeah and then and how many venues do you have now and you just opened a new one correct right well we had seven locations at the time of the shutdown and uh we were working on getting an eighth open which we did finish during the pandemic Okay. And the new one, where's the new location now? It's in uh, New Hall, which is okay. in North Los Angeles County. Great. So eight, eight venues. So you go from eight venues to it's time to shut down. Do you start researching? I mean, did you at that point have a virtual cinema option or had you ever had a virtual cinema option up until then? We had never had virtual cinema up till then. So um, within days of the shutdown, uh, you know, it's a Sunday night, we hear that it's shutting down. So the next day, you know, we get all the staff, you know, movies are over, forget it. Don't tell your staff not to come tomorrow. Um, you know, let's start shutting down the theaters. Um, and, and, you know, and within a, a day or two, um, some distributors were coming to us and saying, hey, we're going to put this on, on VOD. Uh -huh. And we'd like to, you know, create this scenario where we're sharing the revenue with you um, if you'll continue to promote it. And that was the birth of virtual cinema. Um, actually, we had one film that um, had already proposed doing something like that um, as part of its theatrical run because they were concerned that people weren't going to come out to the movie theaters. So that was almost pre-planned uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and that was a Phoenix, Oregon, uh, the title. So, uh -huh. but we started, you know, with it by March 25, I think we had already launched with, uh, you know, probably a, a half dozen titles 
and I even added a few more by that first Friday, the 27th. Wow. Um, so you and, pivoted and quickly. Following. So what? <laughs> you pivoted fast, really fast. Well, I mean, look, it's not, we pivoted as quickly as we could. And, and more importantly, our distributors pivoted, you know, uh -huh. because they had films that were in release. Um, that had just had the rug pulled out of me. Either they were in release or they were films that were just about to open. Yeah. So what do you do with a picture like, uh, uh, you know, and then we danced or Baccarat or Wild Goose mm -hmm. Lake. I just um, watched you know, Baccarat last yeah, night. You know, to, to name a few of them that were yeah. literally like in theaters and it had their runs curtailed, you know, to three days. Yeah. So as quickly as the distributors were able to set it up for VOD, many of them agreed to, um, you know, to, 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 to allow individual portals mm -hmm. for exhibitors so that we could start tracking some of this. Now, at that time, this wasn't anything we had in house. We were just pointing people to third party links. Right. And they could have been different, different third parties for each film. Right. right? And different third parties for every film and for every pay. And you couldn't use your Lemley stored value cards for purchases. Yeah. And if you figured out how to get one film on your Roku or your device, didn't necessarily mean it was going to work the same way with another film. Right. And who did you go to for a refund? So there were a whole host of problems, you know, which we thought, well, we'll put up with those problems if this is going to be for three months. <laughs> yeah. um, and when it became clear that it was going to be more than three months, we, you know, then pivoted to, you know, having a, a proprietary platform. In-house. Yeah, I, uh, um, I'm the director of programming for a film society uh, up in Erie, Pennsylvania and we had quite a challenge of pivoting to virtual cinema because our audiences um, you know a lot of our audiences are older people mm -hmm. um, and there was quite a you know some technical hurdles and challenges there and when we first did our virtual cinema it did not go uh, very well did you have any you know, growing pains, challenges with education. How did you how did you go about getting the message out, marketing it? Did you, you know, do some kind of tutorials and kind of walkthroughs or? Well, tutorials were difficult to impossible, given that every plat film was a different, uh, you know, process. Yeah. Um, I guess when you rolled out your proprietary. Um, yeah, I guess because I imagine probably you had those same struggles with your audiences too, like doing the technical support and where do people turn to for their problems? It, it was, yeah, it was just all over the place. And, you know, and, and it's happening in an environment, at least for us, where we had gone from, you know, 150 staff to five or wow. four. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and those four, even though they were not running movie theaters, we were still shuttering the movie. We were in the process of shutting the movie theaters down and everything that was involved with that, including, you know, dealing with terminations of staff and so right. forth. So I'm sure the motivation for your own platform was probably out of the early headaches, I would assume. And the yeah, the motivation was out of the early headaches. The motivation was at some level into saying once now that we're in this space, you know, how do we stay here? Um, we assumed that as we were coming out of the closure, whenever that happened, that there would still be hesitancy about returning to movie theaters and some people would appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it was always also just, I mean, look, we've always been dealing uh, in our circuit with, um, you know, just the, the vast reach size of Los Angeles. So we have patrons who follow us, you know, across an area of hundreds of square miles and you know hours of traffic to get from one location to another potentially so right. you know it was quite common for people to say i i really i saw that review i really want to see that film but it's playing in glendale and i live in santa monica and i'm not going to glendale you know and i would say well you know eventually it'll come down on on ancillary um so to be able to you know have an opportunity for people who um, can't get to the theater because of distance, can't get to the theater for another reason. You know, a film plays only one week and they didn't get to see it that one week. They, you know, they made a choice right. to see another movie, not knowing which one was going to end. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a still a future for exhibitors to be involved with virtual. Um, but, you know, the scale depends on, you know, is also a big factor. I mean, you know, look, we, we lost, you know, I mean, virtual is maybe a percent of our normal audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. 
you know. I would imagine, though, in a way, there may be potential there um, because you're not geo blocked to just Los Angeles County, for example, or even just California. You're open to all of the U.S. So it does have an interesting potential maybe in the future to reach like maybe people like me that live, you know, in the in the middle of a place where we're not getting a lot of these art house films. Um, obviously, then it's a huge kind of marketing advertising challenge, but there is a potential there to reach audiences that you've never reached before as sure. well. Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely correct. Um, and, you know, that will be something to explore as we get out into the future. I mean, right now we're still just really reliant on our core group of customers, um, you know, and the advantages that we have. Uh, you know, as we return people to movie theaters, we're actually going to get people who find out for the first time that we have a virtual cinema platform because they just tuned us out. You know, as right. soon as the, as soon as the shutdown happened and movie theaters were closed, it's like, well, I don't need to follow Lemley on Facebook anymore. I don't need to wow. open the email that I get from Lemley. Even if it says free, I'm not going to, you know. Um, That's sad. That's depressing. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, because in so many cases, you know, look, for a lot of brick and mortar businesses, all they could do during this period was ask their customers for support. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that we didn't ask people to buy gift cards or, you know, support us with, you know, essentially a loan, you know, by, you know, buying a stored value card that they would use when we reopened. Right. Um, but, I, you know, there was something about that that, you know, was a sort of desperation perhaps that I didn't want to go to, mm -hmm. especially when the idea was that there was this positive thing that we could share with virtual cinema. And that virtual cinema wasn't just for our benefit, but it was for the benefit of our distributors who, you know, were also having a lot of trouble. Of course. Look, I mean, it's really hard. Once you're home and you're watching on TV, you gravitate towards, you know, the platforms that you're used to supporting at home and on TV. Right. And it's not like there was a shortage of, of films on Prime or Netflix. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. There's just, yeah, sometimes it's it's oftentimes hard to find something, right? Because there's so there's so much. Well, it's hard to find something. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to find something good <laughs> or something or something good for sure. Yeah, that, that's why the, you know, the curation aspect of um, theaters like yours is so important. And I think even more important, I'm I'm sure I'm just uh, preaching to the choir <laughs> here. But, you know, curation to me is so important just because of what you're talking about there. Like, I, I don't know how you feel about um, and maybe you can't say about some of the, let's say, like uh, in-house originals. Um, you know, that are being uh, created by some of these platforms that you mentioned. But for me, I, I find a real challenge in, in finding quality um, things. So I feel like, you know, the art houses, um, the curators, the programmers are even more important now maybe than they ever have been before because there is so much, um, so many films out there. What do you... What are your opinions on that? And who I'm curious, who does the programming and the selections um, at Lemley? Right. Well, I do all the film programming. OK, good taste. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I like to think that, look, it's not that you're going to like everything that you see, but hopefully everything will have um, some reason or purpose for being there, either because of quality or because of a commitment to providing space for independent filmmakers um to have their work seen um in in one you know in one way shape or form but yeah i mean curation is is vitally important and um and, and you know i mean the, the problem is trying to mix the the aesthetic quality of the films that we specialize in with the limitations of home viewing mm -hmm. um you know many of these films really cry out for the the concentration that comes from seeing them in a movie theater and you know, it, it, there's a level where, I mean, home viewing is, is a, when it's your only option, it's your only option. And therefore you take it because you have no other choice. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we have to deal with the, the idea that, that these films, you know, would are, are better, you know, when seen in a movie theater. Yeah, with focused 
focused attention, not your your phone, your you know refrigerator, <laughs> like just all the little distractions. I mean, whatever. I mean, I you know if I watch a movie with my wife, you know, at home, you know there there's no disinhibition to you know talk to her, you know, and ask questions and so forth. And it's like obviously when you're in a movie theater, you know, just the space right. forces a kind of uh, you know. Unless you're one of those people that think you're well, in the yes, living of course, room. Yes, really. <laughs> no, and, and and I mean look, and it, and those are all and those are all real real issues. I mean, because there are people that do look at their phone, you know, in, in during the movie or or are, you know, being distracted and not just distracting themselves, but distracting their neighbors. And that's an unfortunate reality. But I still believe ultimately that the process of giving yourself into this experience, you know puts a different kind of uh, frame of mind. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can have church services on Zoom, but you're not going to concentrate in the same way that you do it if you're in a cathedral. Right. Um, and, yeah. you know, the theaters me, are church. <laughs> yeah. The movie theater is, is the church and the, you know, the films are the gospel. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, at some, at some level, but uh, you know, well, yeah. I'm curious with the, with Lemley, when you had one, the one theater, the first theater, um, or did you did you guys open with a with a couple different venues or was when it my one? grandfather started the business he opened with two theaters wow okay I'm which okay ones are they still around no they're gone okay they're gone which, which um, parts of uh california i assume were they in? here in los angeles in highland park okay and uh so started with two theaters the chain in 1938 we eventually grew to have six locations here in los angeles um, and then TV came along uh -huh. and TV wiped out the neighborhood movie theaters. Mm -hmm. So uh, for many years, it was just one theater, the Los Feliz. And that theater does still exist. It's not part of our chain anymore, but it, it is here in Los Angeles still on Los, on um, Vermont. Okay. Boulevard. And um, yeah, for a decade, it was just that one theater. So we started an expansion again. Has the brand always been independently minded, uh, you know, like non-English speaking art house? Has that always been part of the brand or is that something that you brought to it once you started? Programming? Oh, it's, it's definitely not something I brought to it. Um, I think when the business started, it was mostly just neighborhood movie theaters, uh, you know, double bills, mm -hmm. multiple changes during the week, you know, sort of sub run stuff you know, a, a separate kind of business from the, you know, the, the, the big screens, uh, you know, the premier locations. Um, but even then, uh, we know that when there was a subtitled film that was available, my grandfather, you know, was very much into programming um, uh, foreign language films. Mm -hmm. You know, he was European born. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, uh, something that he wanted to support and also thought was a, a business niche. Um, even in those early days, they were doing recorded, uh, you know, back, you still had recorded operas <laughs> and recorded concerts. So we see handbills for, you know, a concert recital by, uh, you know, Piotr Gorski. Wow. Um, okay. You know, so event cinema, you know, now is something we, we talk about like it's a new invention, but mm -hmm. it's existed all along. Um, just handled differently when you had to actually have a print of these kinds of things and not just you know, digitally transmitted. But um, so, you know, having a broader array of programming was always part of the, um, the MO for us. And then, of course, in that period after TV um, killed the neighborhood theaters and took us down to just that one location, then there began to be a much greater focus on, um, and, and in fact, an exclusive focus almost on, um, on foreign language and independent cinema. Cinema Activist is produced by Lion's Den Productions. Hosted by John C. Lyons. Music by Tony Gray. Support the efforts of Lion's Den Productions by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Lion's Den Productions. Thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. <laughs>